Good morning. Uh, if you're new with us, my name is Michael Mattis. I pastor Saltbox Church. If you're online, I want to look into the camera and say welcome, or if you're even listening or watching in arrears, we are really grateful to have you. I am in the book of Acts, and I am going to take a look at Acts 20. We skipped over a little section in Acts 20. Uh, we're going to look at verse 6 through verse 12. Um, and I call this ordinary to extraordinary. And as we open this up, um, I want you to pose, I want to pose a question for us to sort of ruminate on. And if I do my job right, I'll come back to it at the end of my message. But as we read this text, here's the question. Where is the presence of God most evident and most powerful in this text? Okay? Where is the presence of God most evident and most powerful in this text. Now, before we start reading, I would also say the Bible is literally um, covered, cluttered, you could even say, with earthy and even immoral at points stories, common stories in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In fact, when we open the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we find this King Jesus, fully God and fully man, walking around earth, not mixing with the famous people or the wealthy people or philosophers or even the poets or the educated people of the day. But what we discover is this King Jesus mixing in the midst of ordinary towns and ordinary people and ordinary situations. In other words, this King Jesus chose to come and be born in an ordinary town of Bethlehem, to live in an ordinary town of Nazareth, and he chose to be born in a stable, to die on a rough-hewn wooden cross. And I would propose to you as we open this text that Jesus, this Jesus, if you will, is about the descent of an extraordinary God into our very ordinary, um, mundane, human moments of our daily lives. You follow me? Let me say it this way. <clears throat> when I read, what, even what we're about to read, when I read this, what, what um, speaks even to my heart is if Jesus is interested in these ordinary moments of our lives, then he's also interested in our neighborhoods. And when we fuss with our kids or our spouses or our coworkers or our singleness or our high school or our middle school or where we're going to college or as we pay bills and wash dishes or pay taxes, he is interested in the ordinary. And let me say it like this. Even as we approach this text, it is not the ascent of our lives, so it is not the lifting up of our lives into uh, or unto a holy God in hopes that we, he will approve of how hard we try or how holy or religiously we pray, but rather Christianity is about the descent of this holy, extraordinary God into our very ordinary lives. I almost need to say that again, huh? <laughs> Okay, Christianity, and if you're new here or if you're a doubter or an atheist or a questioner, welcome, just kind of get in the journey. But Christianity, a relationship with Jesus, is not a, an ascent of our lives, if you will, or a, a cleaning up of our lives in hopes that God is gonna prove, approve of how hard we try or how religiously we pray or how good we perform, but rather it is a descent of this extraordinary God into our very human and ordinary lives. That's what Christianity is about. So as we open this, bear in mind that this Jesus, my Jesus, your Jesus, the Gospels are about this story of this God who descended into the lives of tax collectors and carpenters and farmers and homemakers and prostitutes and the uneducated, not unintelligent, mind you, but the uneducated. And in many cases, we've stopped acknowledging the presence and the power of this holy, extraordinary God in the mundane moments of our ordinary lives. You follow me? So it, we're at risk, I would say. Michael's at risk. We are at risk. The American church is at risk of elevating the experience of church or the experience of the Bible or worship. And not that any of this is wrong, but God is most interested not just in this, but actually in engaging you in the earthy, mundane, day-to-day, step-by-step journey of your life. Okay, 
Let's open this up, Acts 20, and I'm going to start reading in verse 6. Next week, we're heading into Acts 21. But we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread. Now, this is like Paul and Luke and a few of the guys that he is journeying with. Dr. Luke actually wrote this book we're reading. Um, But we sailed uh, from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread. Five days later, we joined the others at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Okay, so how long did they stay in Troas? Seven days. Okay, so they're hanging out. They're staying. We don't know exactly where. Verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. That's probably what day? Sunday. Sunday. That's right. This is where it's actually started, where believers started gathering on Sunday. If you want to know why we gather on Sunday, the first day of the week, this is probably where it, where it began. But on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Okay, breaking bread. What are they talking about? They're eating together, so it's a normal meal. Okay, it's an ordinary meal. They're going to break bread, and they're also going to pour some wine. So they're going to drink bread, drink wine, and wine is probably at this day and age different than our, uh, the way we know wine, so don't take this as license. But um, they were no doubt um, eating dinner together, and then after dinner, they are actually going to break bread in terms of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, that's exactly right. Communion, if you prefer. But they are, so, so they are celebrating, they've come together. Now let's hear what it says. Uh, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people because he intended to leave the next day. He kept talking until midnight. Okay, midnight. So what time's dinner? Somebody said 5.30, anybody else? Six, okay, let's just call it six for round numbers. Okay, six o'clock dinner. And Paul decides to preach until, how many hours? If I go long, one of y'all tell me, okay? <laughs> six hours. In fact, this, uh, this text is enormously encouraging to me because I'm actually gonna propose to you that Paul gets really boring right here. Six hours Paul is talking. Now, is there any indicator in the text that this is an extraordinary meal? None. Is there any indication in the text that they had music playing? No. Is there any indication in the text that there was like the table was set beautifully with tablecloths and centerpieces? This is an ordinary, earthy dinner uh, in Troas. They celebrate the Lord's Supper. They break bread together. They eat together. Then they break bread and celebrate communion. And then Paul goes to preaching and he preaches for... This is very encouraging to me as a preacher, by the way. (laughs) Watch watch what's going to happen. Okay. He kept on talking until midnight. That's a run-on sermon. Verse 8. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Okay. If you've been to the Middle East, uh, most of the year during the heat of the day, it is hot. In an upstairs room, heat rises. So in an upstairs room, it gets Hot, okay, even hotter. So at night, now they've crowded a bunch of people into this room. They're packed into an upstairs room. It's probably overcrowded according to the fire codes that didn't exist, right? And to make things worse, uh, it hasn't yet cooled off for the night. To make things worse, everyone is wearing undergarments and then big cloaks and like these warm things, right? And then they have all these lamps lit all the way around the room. So what is the room feeling like? It is hot, okay? We're dripping sweat while Paul preaches for six hours. Okay, so I want you to fully get this. We have an ordinary moment. There's no lights. There's no cameras. There's no, they are in an upstairs room. It is hot and they are sweaty, which probably means they're a little bit smelly. Okay, this is earthy. I'm not trying to be gross. I'm just saying they're probably a little bit sweaty. The windows are now open. They're trying to get some fresh air in there, but the windows are these tiny little, uh, you know, slats that you can kind of get through. So let's keep going here. Okay. Uh, So they kept on talking until midnight. Verse eight, there were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus. Now, why would he be sitting in a window? 
It's hot. He is sweaty, and he is like my kids who are like, no tolerance for heat, right? It is hot, and very, very little tolerance for cold. I'm cold, right? So he is hot. So he's sitting over by the window. He's a smart young man. And usually the way you translate this, he's, he's probably a very young man, maybe 13. We don't know exactly. Um, but seated in a window, window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. I mean, this is a dynamic sermon, right? I mean, people are like, oh, they are captivated for six hours. It is hot. It is sleepy. Eutychus is up there like trying to hang his head out the window to get some fresh air because he is sweating. Paul talks on and on for six hours and he starts... I, it, when I was little, this is funny, but when I was little, um, my brother and sister and I would make fun of, especially our mom, but also our dad, because when they would like read to us after dinner, do you know what they would do? So, so you know what happens, you know, like three out of seven nights a week when I'm reading to my kids? <laughs> and I, the first time it happened, Amelia's like, Daddy, Daddy, wake up. What, did you fall asleep? I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know, and in the, the, the living color of here I am falling asleep, just like I used to make fun of my, oh, the circle of this human experience. Okay. So seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul got a little bit boring. This is very encouraging to me. It's very, very encouraging. As a preacher, this is like, oh, good. Even the Apostle Paul talks too long, got boring, and people went to sleep. <laughs> okay, so as Paul talked on and on, I just want to keep reading that. Um, when he was sound asleep, sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Now, okay, we don't know what this is like, but we have some, a window and his body obviously fits through the window. He's fallen into a deep sleep. Everyone is listening to Paul. We don't know how many of them are sleeping. It is hot and he starts sliding out of the house. There's no like OSHA regulations on, you know, what you have to have around the window. So he probably slides out and he may have even hit his head as he fell down these multiple stories. Could have even broken or done something with his neck, but he has picked up dead. Now, the author of this, I want to remind you, is a guy named Dr. Luke, who is a physician. So in his notes and his details that we find both in the book of Luke that he wrote and in the book of Acts are absolutely impeccable. So his, well, if Dr. Luke says that the guy is, I believe him, that he is, in fact, no longer alive. So he fell uh, from the third story and he was picked up dead. Now, I, you, you gotta remind, let's just remind ourselves about this for a minute. If we were sitting in church and we had a 13 year old who decided to climb up here and we didn't know it, and during the service they fell and perished during the service, what in the world would ensue? I mean, total chaos. We, there would be heartbreak, there would be shrieking, we'd be calling 911, somebody would be doing CPR, there might be a whole line of people. Our, our emergency team would be engaged. Are the parents, how are parents gonna be acting, mom and dad? I mean, a raging wreck. I mean, there has to be total, absolute chaos going on in this little upper room, and suddenly Paul's long and boring sermon is cut. Okay. Don't read scripture like it's not real. I mean, come on, this, can you imagine how people felt and thought in this moment? Verse 10, Paul went down, threw himself on the young man. Now this is very much like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go back there, but it's very much like Elisha and Elijah uh, when they both um, resurrected somebody from the dead. They threw themselves physically on the person. And I think Dr. Luke is making a parallel here. But Paul went down and he threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Now. This is some statement of faith to me. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Now, in this moment, according to what we just read, is he alive? No, he is very much dead. The life is gone from him. In Jewish tradition at this moment, they would say that the life departs from somebody after three days. That's like rabbinic tradition at this day and age. So I think that's probably what Paul is saying, but he's saying it at some level out of faith. Okay, so verse 11, then he went upstairs again. It's like there's some gap here, right? 
He goes down, he throws himself on this guy. Then he says he's alive. Then he went upstairs again and he broke bread and ate. After talking until ooh, daylight, that's what I'm reading the NIV, daylight. So hang on, let's just think about this for a minute. We started at 6 p.m. and we go to midnight, which is, and then we go from midnight to let's say 6 a.m. So how long? Kyle, I don't even think you'd make it 12, if I talked up here 12 hours. I mean, this is like, oh my goodness. He rambled on for 12 hours. Okay. <clears throat> then he went upstairs again and he broke bread. What's interesting to me, he doesn't say he carried Eutychus. He just, I don't know. He went back upstairs again, broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. Verse 12, the people took the young, young man home alive and they were greatly comforted. Okay. So what happened with this young man? He died and he was resurrected. He literally came back. So the very lifeblood, the life entered back into him and he was resurrected. We could talk about Jesus with Lazarus and Jairus, uh, Jairus's daughter. We could talk about Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. We could talk about Peter and Dorcas further on or back in the book of Acts. I think it was Dorcas, but um, Peter and someone in the, in the, earlier in the book of Acts. But regardless, this is the only time in scripture we find Paul um, resurrecting someone from the dead. Okay, now here's what I want you to see. Um, this is a very normal, ordinary gathering, okay? And now, when exactly, think with me, did the presence of the Lord Jesus enter in and was it most powerful? Was it when worship started? Was it when the amazing preacher stepped to the stage and preached for 12 hours? Was it when the guy fell? Was it when they picked him up? Was it when they celebrated communion the first time? Was it when they celebrated communion the second time? When, here's what I want you to begin to get. When did the presence and power of the Lord Jesus enter? It was there the entire time. Okay, it's an ordinary house. In fact, many commentators would say this was even a poor house. Um, because of the way they're, they're on the second floor. That's some convolutedness. I'm not going to go into it. But this is an ordinary house. They're on a second or third floor. It's an ordinary meal. It's a long-winded, boring sermon. Paul puts everybody to sleep. There's an ordinary young man named Eutychus who falls to his death. There's not even any special worship. There's certainly no lights. There's an ordinary act, a tired young man who falls to sleep and he falls to his yeah. I mean, literally, there is nothing spectacular about this. Now, I want to juxtapose something for just a minute, because if we looked at all the literature of the day, so when this was written, all of the literature several hundred years before and after is all glorified. So it is like, um, if, if we looked at uh, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, it's like these great feats and accomplishments, right? If we looked at um, all of the Greco-Roman writings about um, gods and goddesses, if we even looked at the Canaanite writings, um, that have been found right around Israel about their um, sort of epics and their stories about gods and goddesses. All of the writing is absolutely fanciful and it is glorified and it is like um, lifting up the situations of men and women. And suddenly you have the God of the Bible who comes along and not only does he descend, not does, does he take the extraordinary and descend into the ordinary town of Nazareth and live and go to an ordinary cross and die, but he is this impoverished, um, almost homeless uh, man that journeys around. So you have this extraordinary God who comes and infuses the fullness of his life into the ordinary day-to-day -day moments and experience that these regular people are experiencing. This is the gospel. There is nothing spectacular about anything that happened here except what becomes clear is the presence and power of God was there when they started the meal, was there when they celebrated communion, was there when Paul preached a super boring six hour sermon and then did another six hour assessment to his sermon. It was there when Eutychus fell asleep. It was there, the presence of God was there when Eutychus falls from the window. The presence of God is there when Eutychus is raised from the dead. But God is most interested not in the extraordinary 
extraordinary or things being super special or even emotional or these experiences. Rather, he is interested in your mundane, ordinary Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday moments. He is interested in the moment when you're up in the middle of the night and your kids are driving you crazy or you're in a fuss with your spouse, or you're washing dishes and you're wiping the counter, or you have to pay your taxes, or you're in a fight with your coworker, or you fill in the blank. This is the God who is not distant and he is not trying to like raise you up and make you become some high holy monk or something else. No, 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 no. This is the God who actually descends from heaven into our ordinary day-to-day, moment-by-moment existence. And he wants to meet you just like he met this ordinary group of people over dinner and in a boring sermon, he wants to meet you in your day-to-day, moment-by-moment journey and experience. That's worth following a God like this. Let me tell you two things. Um, There's a Uh, artist, a musician that I like by the name of Corey Asbury. And he wrote a song called Endless Alleluia that I love. Um, Stacy, you actually led it for the first time I'd ever heard it. And I was so, I just, I've fallen in love with it um, since then. But there's a line in it that goes like this. In the moments where you go unnoticed, in the ordinary day to day, countless miracles of life around us point like arrows to your name. So good. In the moments where you go unnoticed, God, where he goes unnoticed, in the moments where you go unnoticed, in the ordinary day-to-day, countless miracles of life around us point like arrows to your name. Let me bring you into my ordinary for just a minute. Abby and I, I'm not going to go too far into this, but we've got um, a child who's in a um, type 1 diabetic, and they're in a transition with their medical devices, and things have been difficult, and we're not sleeping very much. We've got another child who's got um, some ear things going on, chronic ear infections, and they're having tubes put in their ears tomorrow, and I'm really excited. Um, and and, uh, and your, your life might be infinitely more difficult than that. I'm not really trying to say that at all, but, but here's what I want you to hear. Over the last number of months, we haven't had a lot of sleep in our house. I don't know about you, but when there's lack of sleep that builds up over months, there's a little bit of shortness and sometimes even unkindness that, that leaks out of a husband-wife relationship. You know that? <laughs> and occasionally, I see some of you pointing at your spouse. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. Um, <laughs> and the other thing that begins to happen is you begin to, I begin to at least, become um, uh, frustrated with uh, some of my kids at different moments, especially in the middle of the night. And I've even found myself a couple of moments where I'm like grinding my teeth, like, would you please go back to bed? Ordinary, okay? Friday, I usually, I try to take Fridays and Saturdays off. I don't often succeed. Um, long story short, I'm also a landscaper, and Friday morning, after some sleepless nights, I had to go and move um, a bunch of rock on the Cape Fear River. So Friday morning, I'm preparing this sermon, and I find myself standing in 18 inches of water on the Cape Fear River, and we couldn't use machines, uh, long story short, to move these 250-pound boulders that were moving into place. And so guess what? We were moving them by hand and my guys kept on throwing they were a group and they were dropping these big boulders into the mud and the mud was conveniently splashing up on me and I'm finding myself going oh the ordinariness and then I'm rolling these boulders uh, into place. And I don't always get to work out with my guys, um, but occasionally I do. And in this particular moment and on this day, I had this moment where I'm sitting there and I'm tempted to be frustrated with all that's happening on so many different fronts. And all of a sudden I stand up and we were out there early because the tide um, was low early and we had to work at low tide. And I see the sun beginning to come up and the wind is blowing. And all of a sudden I am gripped in the mud and in the muck of the Cape Fear River, which is not very clean if you've ever stood in the Cape Fear River river, that this is the God. And I am just gripped. Oh my goodness, here I am. I am alive. I am in love with my wife. I am in love with my kids. We have a number of things that we're going through. God is working in our lives. He's working in our marriage. He's working in our church. And I just have this moment as the sun's coming up where I just start to worship God in the ordinary, in the day-to-day, standing in the mud, literally wiping mud off my face. 
A few hours after that, I had planned with my dad um, and to take Ezra, our youngest, and dad and Ezra and I were going to go up to the country to a friend of ours who's like, long story short, he's 93, and we're going to put up a couple of deer stands, and one of them's this double stand that I'm going to get to put Ezra in next to me. So mind you, this is after my um, Cape Fear River morning. So I get out there, and I'm working with my dad. We're we're, um, um, rebuilding this one little deer stand, and I'm standing up on this stand, and I look down, and I got my dad over here. Here and I got Ezra behind me eating his turkey sandwich, complaining about something. <laughs> and I have this flashback to me being four years old with my dad and with his dad. And I'm like gripped, and I begin to, as I'm up there, I start like these tears start rolling down my cheeks, and I'm just gripped by the faithfulness of God over the years and the way God shows up in the mundane. And in the little one complaining about the sandwich, I'm looking at my dad, thanking him. My papa, that I called him, is no longer here. He's now in heaven. And I'm just thinking about the way God continues to make himself present in very ordinary, broken situations where if we're not careful, we can begin to navel gaze and look in or look next to us and become critical of the people around us and judgmental and ugly. And all of a sudden, if you're not careful, the kingdom of God is so far removed from you or we can begin to embrace that this is the God who shows up in the mud and in the muck and in the sleepless nights and in the fusses with your spouse or your coworkers or your kids, in the lack of health, in the absolute crisis. I just walked around the, the house of the couple that, that, that lost their house a week and a half ago to a fire, total loss, and we just walked around it and cried. And I'm encouraging them that God indeed shows up in the tragic and in the painful and in the difficult. And if I could call us to anything, church, it would be that this is the God who doesn't just want to get you into church. He doesn't want to just get you to worship. That is good. You need to be in a local church, this one or another one. But this is the God that wants to meet with you, walk with you in the ordinary day to day when things are difficult and challenging and frustrating. And if you will begin to stop and look for him, he is already Here, he is already there. We often say, Lord Jesus, would you come here and be with us today? Then that's not a bad prayer because it represents a heart posture, but he is already in the house. He is already on the earth. He's already in your living room. He's already at wherever you find yourself. He is already there. It is not him that is left. It is us that has hardened our hearts, chosen not to see him, focused on the negativity, fussing about the people around us instead of beginning to lift our vision, perhaps to the rising sun as you're standing in the muck of the Cape Fear River and begin to thank God for where he is and what he's doing and begin to find his person and presence or rather let his person and presence that is already there find you. (sighs) Our life's perfect, by the way. (laughs) The Eutychus story, I think, tells us two things. It tells us the God who meets us in the ordinary, but it also tells us about a deeply personal God that wants to step down into our day to day. And I would say Uh, to my own heart and self, and I would say to you all this morning, stop chasing God in another glorious service or another wonderful book or another experience or some like tantalizing emotional whatever or another great preach and begin to recognize he is already here. He's already there. Begin to still your mind and your heart. And instead of looking for the next experience, which is so American, still yourself and recognize this is the God who called himself Emmanuel, which means God with us. It means he's already here. We have a couple of groups here. They're kind of guinea pig groups at this point, but I've taken on a group of guys every year and we call them a Jesus journey group. And they're um, reading books on my second consecutive year. They're reading these books and they're doing a one year Bible and they're in a five year journal and um, they're they're doing all these things and they don't know this yet. Some of them are sitting here listening to me. They, They have no idea really what all this is about. And here is what it is all about. It is learning to practice the presence of the Lord Jesus in the ordinary day to day. 
It's learning to recognize his still small voice. I'd encourage you this morning to be still and to know that he is God, to be still and encounter the extraordinary God in your ordinary day to day. Now, I think I'd also say this morning that this miracle points to the multifaceted dimensions of our new life in Christ. Soul, mental, emotional health, uh, resurrection power of Jesus, the spiritual resurrection power of Jesus, relational resurrection power of Jesus. The body of this young man is literally healed and resurrected. All aspects of the resurrection power of Jesus applies to your life. Now, let me also just pause this and let's say another thing about little Eutychus. Can you imagine how Eutychus fell when he woke up and they told him about what he just did? How did he feel? Okay, let me pause, hang on a second. Um, some of you know my story. I've shared that I've spent seven years in a cult. I've got older kids. I've got a tragic um, experience. Occasionally people meet me out there and they go, oh, you're the pastor that was in a cult. They throw, I'm like, yep, yeah. and I just have to own it, right? Now, can you imagine Eutychus? Once he is resurrected from the dead, he walks around the city of Troas and people look at him and say, oh, there's Eutychus who? <laughs> fell asleep, fell out and died and was, okay, how might he feel? Just a minute, go there. Embarrassed, ashamed, like could he be like, I mean, oh, I mean, he, he would have to um, overcome some of that. And here's what I want you to see here. God will use your foolishness for his glory. God will use your flesh and sin for his glory. God will use your weakness for his glory. God will use your sleepiness for his glory. God will use it all for your good and his glory if you will begin to lay it down and entrust it fully to him. Make sense? Now, I'd also say to you this morning that grace is a little bit radical and the gospel of Jesus is a little bit offensive. And most of us prefer a self-help gospel and a gospel of at least some self-effort. And then we come to a text like Eutychus. Did he do anything to earn it? Did he do anything to deserve it? Did he do anything to merit being resurrected? I mean, he just fell asleep, wasn't paying attention during the sermon. And Paul went down and... Raise him to life in the power of the gospel. The resurrection power of Jesus, here's the takeaway, is working in and around your life when you know it and when you don't, when you doubt and when you believe. God is actively working in you and around you and it is not even dependent on you, but your ability to reign and rule with him in this life is about receiving the gift of faith, receiving the gift of love, giving your heart to King Jesus and to stopping all of the running around looking for the next thing and acknowledge that he is already here. I think if I acknowledged a problem, I'm not being critical of the larger church around us. This has been in my life. This has been in the church around this country and even the world. But if you define being a Christian as merely attending a regular church gathering to get filled or emotionally inspired, instead of defining being a Christian as the slow and arduous journey of learning to recognize the presence of this holy, extraordinary God in your ordinary, earthy, daily life, you are missing it. You're missing it. There is no substitute for knowing and being known by the God of heaven in the ordinary, mundane moments. Okay. I'm gonna give you five ways to engage the extraordinary God in the mundane, ordinary moments of your life. This has taken years of learning, years of reading, seminary classes. Are you ready? Here we go. Five ways. Number one, stop. Silence your voice and still your heart. If you're in a fuss with your spouse, if you're in a fuss with a coworker, if you're in a fuss with a neighbor or a friend, stop. Stop talking. Still your voice, still your heart. Number two, seek Jesus in simple prayers. You don't have to have some religious, wonderful prayer. Jesus, just call on the name of Jesus. Number three, look for his gentle hand. His hand is gentle, but it is here. It's here. Listen, number four, for his still, small voice. And then number five, re-engage in life 
and this time full of the Holy Spirit, not of yourself. This is what I'm saying here, church. Walking with Jesus is not about self-improvement, making yourself better, ascending through high holy prayers. No, 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 no. It's literally about resting in the finished work of the cross that this extraordinary God has come down to walk with you and to fill you and to journey in your very ordinary experience. And he is already where you are. The question is, are you going to acknowledge it? Can you still yourself, still your heart, still your mind, recognize him and then re-engage in life, this time full of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask this question again as we close. Where is the presence of God the most powerful in this story? The beginning, the middle, the end? Everywhere. God is Emmanuel. This would be a perfect Christmas sermon. Emmanuel is God with us. As we close, in fact, worship band, if you'll come back up, we're going to close in a worship song. But I want us to pause and I want to invite you in this closing song to still your heart, to still the multitude of anxious thoughts within your mind and to begin to look for his gentle hand, to begin to listen to his still small voice and to stop looking for the next thing and begin to recognize that this God is in the present moment with you right now. Father, I pray for our little congregation here, those here and those online, that you would give us Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would help us be a people that recognizes your still small voice, your gracious hand in our lives. And I pray that you would help us become a people that stops the anxiety and the running around and the chasing of the next thing or the next event and instead recognize that you're already there. You're already in the future. You're in the past. You're in the present. You're here with us. You stand outside of time. And Father, I pray that you would surround our congregation, our church family, and that Father, as we navigate, that you would fill us with the person and the presence of King Jesus in the ordinary day to day. Father, as we go today, may you cause your face to shine upon us and your gracious hand to rest upon us. And may we become increasingly aware of your ever-present, still, small voice. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.